On your next shift, you pick up a patient with abdominal pain and you wonder, is this going to be that one in five case of a patient who needs emergent surgery for their abdominal pain? And while you're wondering about that, you stumble upon a patient with a painful swollen joint and you wonder, are they having something actively destroying their joint right now? In this episode of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine podcast, we will discuss risk factors for small bowel obstruction in ileus and and how to manage them. We will also address painful swollen joints, including septic arthritis and gout. With you is Dr. Danya Koja, an emergency physician, mostly practicing in Florida. And this is Dr. Wendy Chang, an emergency physician and neurointensivist in the Baltimore, Washington area. And this is the December issue of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine podcast. Like every month, there's more than just the two lessons we mentioned. We will also discuss things like the Dick's Hallpike Maneuver, acute otitis media, differentiating types of heart blocks, and much more. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's episode of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine podcast. And today we're going to be talking about the December 2022 issue of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine. And if you don't know what that is, what are you waiting for? Critical Decisions is ASAP's official CME publication. Each month, we talk about two lessons that are either bread and butter emergency medicine or things that are cutting edge. There are also a lot of other features, such as the critical cases in orthopedics and trauma, one of our newer features to the clinical pediatrics, and we also even go through a literature review every month, which is my favorite. So for our first lesson of this issue, holding up the show, small bowel obstruction and alias. Thank you to doctors Anthony Han, Farouk Mekri, and Colin Danko for writing this article. You know, abdominal pain is a common ED presentation, and we often think about small bowel obstruction or ileus as part of our differential. Did you know that it actually counts for 20% of emergent operations for abdominal pain, specifically small bowel obstruction? Yeah, I was quite surprised by that number too. And that's really scary. And I guess that's why these are on our differential for patients presenting with abdominal pain. Now, obviously, when we think about all comers with abdominal pain that come to the ED, small bowel obstructions and ileus really only account for 2 to 4%, and our differential is quite wide, including gastroenteritis, constipation, maybe appendicitis or cholecystitis, or even scarier things also like mesenteric ischemia or less common things like Ogilvy syndrome. All right, so let's start with the basic symptoms. How do these patients present? We know how these patients present. The classic description of a patient coming in with a small bowel obstruction may describe obstipation, crampy abdominal pain, as well as nausea and vomiting. Now, obviously, if their nausea and vomiting is quite severe and they're not even eating, they can still have progressive abdominal distension and vomiting because there are normal gastric biliary pancreatic secretions that will accumulate and build up. Remember that small bowel obstruction can be partial or complete. You can even have two points of obstruction causing a closed loop obstruction like from an incarcerated hernia or closed ileocecal valve. And the sequelae of this can really range from dehydration, maybe even renal failure, bowel ischemia, or perforation. When we talk about ileus, though, they definitely present similarly, and they're commonly thought of as a pseudo-obstruction because there's no actual obstructing point. It's more from intestinal paralysis or some sort of a non-mechanical stoppage. But ileus can actually affect any portion of the GI tract, whereas, of course, small bowel obstruction, when we're talking about that, we're specifically talking about the small bowel. Got it. So small bowel obstruction is always in the small bowel. So <laughs> who is most at risk of small bowel obstruction or ileus? We talked a little bit about post-surgery, but what else? Yeah, definitely post-surgery from adhesions and such. Patients with hernia certainly are also at risk. Don't forget about Crohn's disease as well as ulcerative colitis. The swelling and scar tissue that form also is a setup for small bowel obstructions. Now, when we think about even intra-abdominal cancers like peritoneal metastases or if patients who've gotten radiation to the abdomen, that is also another risk factor, as well as even gastric bypass. We may have also even learned about intraluminal causes like lymphoma or bezoars, but those are, of course, rare. And then in children, a common cause is intussusception. In older adults, we have to think about sigmoid valvulus. And then in the pregnant patients, we have to think about cecal valvulus. That's a great pearl. Any particular exam findings that should raise our suspicion for ileus or small bowel obstruction? 
Well, Dania, we always learn about those high-pitched tinkling vowel sounds. I don't think I've ever so heard like them. my voice. <laughs> Listeners, Dania says her voice is the example <laughs> of to listen for. I don't know about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. An example for high-pitched. Okay, I am okay. not tinkling. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Well, I've never heard of high-pitched bowel sounds before, and the article mentions that you may hear these when the small bowel obstruction is developing. But really, over hours as that progresses, you really are dealing with diminished or absent bowel sounds. The scary things to look out for, of course, are signs of peritonitis. You do want to do a rectal exam to evaluate for impaction, but don't be fooled by simply the presence of stool, as that does not rule out a small bowel obstruction. Emesis is common, and it may be bilious or feculent, really depending on where the obstruction is. And we do want to ask about things like when the patient's last bowel movement was, and whether they're passing flatus. But again, don't be fooled by simply the ability to pass flatus, because that can still be present if you're dealing with a partial or developing small bowel obstruction. Got it. So let's say we're concerned about small bowel obstruction because of the history and the physical, and we heard tinkling even. How are we supposed to diagnose it? Do we have to CT everybody? I think CT is probably part of a lot of the care of these patients. Although we can have some classic findings on X-ray, such as small bowel dilation, lack of colonic dilation or gas, or maybe even things like a string of beads sign that the article has a great example of, or air fluid levels. Of course, X-ray is not as sensitive or specific as CT, but if you find these abnormalities, maybe that can help initiate the care they need much faster. If you do get a CAT scan, though, IV contrast doesn't necessarily increase your sensitivity for the diagnosis, but it can evaluate for other things such as bowel ischemia. And PO contrast is definitely not necessary, as just simply the natural fluid in the bowels can act as a natural contrast agent, and you don't have to take time to force a nauseous, vomiting patient to drink the bowel contrast. But it can be helpful if you are dealing with more of a low-grade small bowel obstruction. Ultrasound is obviously something that we use more and more in the ED, and has good sensitivity and specificity, but it's not as good for localizing where the actual obstruction is or if there are signs of ischemia or perforation. And labs are really not helpful, but of course, they can help maybe support a clinical picture, such as if you have an elevated lactate, maybe you're more concerned about ischemia. Got it. So how do we manage these patients? Do all of them need surgery? Well, thankfully, conservative treatment can be quite successful. If patients are hypovolemic, you do want to give some fluid resuscitation, maybe replace and treat any electrolyte derangements. If there are signs of peritonitis or shock, obviously these patients would need emergent surgical intervention. But generally, like I mentioned, conservative treatment with hydration, nasogastric decompression, and really for patients who need surgery, you're dealing with patients who have bowel ischemia, necrosis, perforation, and these patients are also going to need some antibiotics in preparation for their surgery. If you are dealing with purely an ileus, most of the times it is just supportive care, but don't forget to discontinue medications that can really slow down bowel motility, like anticholinergic medications. Got it. Such great pearls in a short, sweet article about something that ends up causing 20% of emergent operations of abdominal pain, apparently. So some risk factors we don't nearly think about as much as, you know, surgery for small bowel obstruction are things like sigmoid vulvulus in older patients and intussusception in children. And the interesting one is cecal vulvulus in pregnant people. And apparently, if you hear high-pitched tinkling bowel sounds, then call Wendy because she's never heard them before. And then, of course, you know, get that CT on your patient so that you can actually identify the location and the cause of that obstruction. Not everybody needs surgery, but definitely hydration, NG decompression, and watching the patients, hydrating them, making sure they are not peritonitic, if that's even a word, and call your surgeons early. Thanks, Dania. That was an awesome summary. Well, switching gears to the little ones, our clinical pediatrics this month is about acute otitis media. And I really like this article because it highlights a very common scenario, a two-year-old toddler who's coming in with a fever and upper respiratory infection, which is like all of the patients. So how do we go from this to diagnosing that acute otitis media? Well, the article mentions that the only symptom associated with an increased probability of acute otitis media is ear pain which 
obviously in the young kids less than two years old, I don't know how reliable they are in telling us that they have ear pain. But it is also important to remember that it's not very sensitive and half of the patients don't actually have any ear pain. In your assessment of the patient, though, the pneumatic otoscopy is very sensitive in showing that a bulging, cloudy, non-mobile tympanic membrane is essentially the diagnostic criteria for acute otitis media. There is a great graphic in the article that explains how this works. That's very insightful. That said, reality is we don't really have access to pneumatic otoscopy in most EDs. So how are we supposed to diagnose acute otitis media if we don't have that magical otoscope? And we can't make two-year-old cells what's going on. <laughs> That's right. So thankfully, there are some criteria that can use. So you're looking for acute onset of symptoms, signs of middle ear inflammation, and signs of a middle ear effusion. Now remember, just having redness of the tympanic membrane is not enough by itself because the tympanic membrane gets red with crying, with allergies, with a lot of things. If the TM is normal in color and it is mobile, then the diagnosis is essentially ruled out. There are also some great pictures of abnormal looking tympanic membranes in the article. All right, so let's talk about the causes of that acute otitis media and of course, the million dollar question, antibiotics. Well, we know that most cases of acute otitis media are viral, but obviously we're worried about cases that are bacterial. There are also other causes, like I already mentioned, potentially from allergies. Distinguishing them is quite tricky. And in any case, though, many of these actually resolve spontaneously without the need for actual antibiotic treatment. Our goal is, of course, to give antibiotics only to bacterial acute otitis media if they have otorrhea or other severe illness, or if they're two years old or younger. The rest of the patients, though, really can just be treated supportively with symptomatic care. If you are choosing to treat with antibiotics, we want to give high dose amoxicillin, so that's 90 milligrams per kilogram per day for a 10-day course. If the patient has failed recent antibiotics, then you can consider amoxicillin clavulanic acid for broader coverage. And if you're dealing with patients with a true penicillin allergy, you can consider macrolides, clindamycin, or cephalosporins such as ceftonir. If you do find a perforation, though, of the tympanic membrane, you do want to add topical antibiotics in addition to the oral antibiotics, such as ofloxacin. But if your child already has tympanostomy tubes already in place, you can simply just give topical antibiotics and not oral antibiotics. What a great pearl. Now, there's always this fear, though, that if you don't treat acute otitis media with antibiotics, we're going to end up with complications such as mastoiditis. Is this true or are we just being paranoid? We're actually just paranoid. Complications such as mastoiditis actually occur quite idiopathically rather than from prolonged undertreatment. So this is why we actually should evaluate for mastoiditis in all kids with acute otitis media. And then another complication that we think about is persistent middle ear infusion, which really doesn't need antibiotic treatment, but rather they need to be followed up and maybe getting tympanostomy tubes. Wow, that is a huge relief. All right. Now, this is not a typical ED question, but sometimes patients ask, why does my kid keep getting ear infections? How are we supposed to deal with that question? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of friends and families ask that too, as well as, of course, our patients and their parents. And I learned a lot from this feature, which is that you can actually have increased incidence of acute otitis media with breastfeeding, with exposure to secondhand smoke, and the use of pacifiers. But when we're really dealing with quote unquote recurrent cases, you may have to actually consider whether the child has eustachian tube dysfunction. And this is really talking about more than three cases of acute otitis media in six months or more than four in 12 months. If you do find that you're dealing with a true recurrent case and these patients have middle ear infusions, then like we kind of mentioned already, you should refer these patients to outpatient otolaryngoscopy. You and I refer them to who? What did I say? <laughs> Otolaryngoscopy. Oh, is that what I said? Uh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> You're so good at hearing. I was like, oh, why is that what you say, Road? Thank you. Good job. I mean, you okay. know what? If you find an otolaryngoscope that has a clinic on its own, it's probably better. You know, I mean, we are always, there's a shortage. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. All right. 
If you do have a patient with true recurring cases of acute otitis media, and you find that they have middle ear infusions, then you should refer them to otolaryngology for possible tympanostomy tubes. But in all reality, many patients nowadays don't really get their sick care from their pediatrician, so it's really up to us to make these diagnoses and refer them. Very true. Now, keeping up with babies with problems, this one is thankfully a lot more rare and a lot more scary. I'm not sure about you, but I do not like toddlers with bloody stools, and that is what our critical image is about. I agree. I don't like toddlers, nor are toddlers with bloody stool. (laughs) I may have just offended like all of our listeners. I'm sorry. Toddlers are cute, but not when they have illnesses. (laughs) So the differential, of course, of bloody stool and toddlers is a lot more, and the history is usually limited. We do worry about conditions like intussusception and malrotation, as well as AV malformations. And don't forget about infections or even foreign body ingestions as well as abdominal or perineal injuries. Family history of inflammatory bowel disease is also important to obtain. All right, so let's talk about the imaging part of this. How can we use imaging to help us? Well, after you get a good history and physical exam, including a rectal exam to look for anal fissures or injuries, you can use x-rays of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to exclude foreign bodies, such as button batteries, which is obviously the scary thing. And if that's negative, then you can use an ultrasound to rule out into susception. And if that is negative, then you can consider getting a nuclear scan to evaluate for ectopic gastric mucosa, such as with Meckel's diverticulum. All right, let's back up here for a second and talk about these nuclear scans, because it's not something that we're familiar with in the emergency department. What is all that about? Yeah, it's true. I don't know how many times we've actually ordered nuclear scans from the ED, other than for you know, VQ. Um, I, I, I know, I know. Um, zero, <laughs> zero for Meckel's diverticulum. That's true, exactly. So how this works is you're going to inject some radioactive tracer and you're going to get serial imaging, which is over 60 minutes at really a rate of one frame per minute. So a lot of images. And you're looking for uptake of the radio tracer. In this case, you're looking for uptake by the gastric mucosal cells. And so normally you're going to have these radio tracer uptake in the stomach, in the bladder after it's you know excreted. But if you find uptake in other locations, then you're worried about this ectopic gastric mucosa. And that's usually in the meclos diverticulum. Bleeding from this abnormal gastric mucosa is caused by ulceration, and there's other complications as well. But if you are able to get one of these scans, it's quite sensitive. Great pearls about something we don't often order, probably should know a little bit more about. Our literature review this month is an article by Natsui Yatel that was published in Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2019, and it's entitled, Outpatient stress testing for suspected acute coronary syndrome after a negative workup. This is definitely a very common scenario we face in the ED, dealing with patients who are presented with chest pain or other anginal symptoms that we're considering ACS. And we all know to get a good history, a physical exam, an ECG, and some cardiac biomarkers to help us overall risk stratify. If your ED workup, such as with your ECG and troponin, are negative, then really we're trying to decide how to further assess for unstable angina and the risk of major cardiac events. And so in this case, we're really talking about who to get a stress test in and how to do so and what type of logistics to coordinate. Now, the guidelines recommend outpatient stress testing for this population should be done within 72 hours. And so this particular study actually looked at that. How feasible is it and what did they find? This particular study was done within the Kaiser system, which we all know is quite an integrated system where the ED physicians can actually order the stress testing themselves. And the study looked at how many of these patients ultimately actually obtained the test within the recommended time frame as well as the rate of these major adverse cardiac events, MACE, as well as other demographic and logistical information. And it's a huge study, included almost 8,000 patients, and it actually showed that only one-third of patients got their stress tests within three days of ED discharge. 
and 90% overall had to complete it within a month. And so kind of scary that even within such an integrated health system that only one third of patients was able to get this within that 72 hour recommendation. Now, the strongest factors associated with completing this stress testing was actually the day of the week that they were seen in the ED and the test was ordered. And so patients who were seen and discharged on Thursdays and Fridays were five times less likely to get their testing in time. That kind of makes sense, some of the logistics of coordinating around weekends and such. But there are also other system level and non-clinical factors that definitely contributed to this as they saw quite a wide range of completion rates even across various ED within their system. Now that said though, when you look at the overall rate of major adverse cardiac events, it was actually quite low for all the patients in this cohort. And they actually found that there was no difference among those who actually got their stress testing within 72 hours and those who did not. They even performed a subgroup analysis looking at these patients' heart scores, whether they were low, moderate, high risk, and found that that didn't have an effect on their rate of major adverse cardiac events. I think we have several takeaways from this particular study. One is that it's really quite hard to adhere to these guidelines to arrange and complete stress testing within 72 hours. And so I think there needs to be a lot more work done, definitely institutionally, health system-wise to improve this. But at the same time, we are dealing with quite a low risk of major adverse cardiac events overall. The study found less than 1%. So potentially, we should even reconsider whether or not these recommended guidelines are actually necessary. And so I think a good article for all of us to review, for sure. Thank you, Wendy, for taking us through this article. It is very interesting and quite eye-opening. Staying on the topic of cardiac things, the critical ECG this month is second degree AV block, which is a Mobitz type 1. And this really cool ECG highlights a very common conundrum, which is differentiating between a Mobitz 1 and a Mobitz 2, which can be nearly impossible when you have a 2 to 1 conduction. So you basically have one QRS for every two Ps that are on the EKG, as is the case in this one. However, there is one tiny little hint in there where you have a couple of instances that show a three to two conduction, and that lets you know that it is a Mobitz one. So check it out and see if you can figure out which of these beats are the ones that give you the hint. Very interesting. Now for our critical procedure this month, it's not something that we would think of as the word procedure, but it's definitely critical. It's a Dix halt bike maneuver. And as you know, Wendy, I can talk about this for hours, but I won't bore you and make our listeners drive into a tree, so I'll keep it short and sweet. In summary, when patients are suspected of having BPPV, or benign positional pragmatismal vertigo, which is having a canalith in one of your three ear canals, it's going to be either in the posterior, in the lateral or horizontal, or the anterior semicircular canal. And you basically have to use some agitating maneuver, such as the dix hall bike, to induce the symptoms and the nystagmus and confirm your diagnosis. Now, the dix hall bike specifically is the one that would agitate the canaliths that are hanging out in the posterior canal, which is the most common one, or the ones that are hanging out in the anterior canal. Now, we do still have a third type, which is what we talked about, the lateral horizontal. The dix hall bike is not going to agitate those, so you're not going to be able to diagnose it on a dix hall bike. Those are the people who need supine roll tests. Another important thing to remember about the Dix Hall Pike is that if somebody is sitting there and when you're looking at them, they have nystagmus, so it's unprovoked and it's at rest, those are not the people that are going to ever, ever have BPPV. So don't even bother doing a Dix Hall Pike because it's going to be really annoying. Good reminders. Now, refresh your memory. How do we do this? So there's a great figure in the article. It's really quite simple. The most important part, in my opinion, is to coach the patient on what to expect. Specifically, that it is very likely to induce the symptoms because that's literally how it works. And in the majority of cases, if you have the luxury of time, pre-medication with antiemetics can be really helpful so that you don't get vomit on your clothes. Now, what you basically do is you start with the patient sitting up and then you quickly drop their torso to the stretcher with their head hanging over the edge of the table and rotate it 30 to 45 degrees to one side. If the tests are positive, then you will see the typical nystagmus within like 30 seconds and the symptoms will be reproduced. The patient will tell you they feel it and you will see it. And then you repeat it on the other side. 
Now, the symptoms are going to be more severe and the nystagmus more prominent when the affected ear is the one that's down towards the ground. Now, when we say typical nystagmus, what that means is that for posterior BPPV, it's upbeat and torsional, so it goes in circles, circles. Whereas for the anterior, it can be downbeat. And patients are going to want to close their eyes, so help them keep it open so you can see that typical nystagmus and diagnosis. A very good review of an important diagnostic tool. I think check out the pictures because you were not able to see Dania, you know, demonstrating and miming the procedure on our video. Sorry. Or you can just reach out to us and say, can you please make videos now with your podcast? And we will just do that. Right, Wendy? Dania will. She'll demonstrate to Dick's Hall Pike. <laughs> <laughs> so for our critical cases in orthopedics and trauma, it's a case of a shoulder dislocation that occurred like six weeks ago and the patient's neurovascularly intact. So what are we supposed to do? Six weeks ago, what are they doing in the ED? They were waiting in the waiting room. <laughs> oh, oh, got it. That, that is uh, definitely a possibility. But by definition, any shoulder dislocation greater than three weeks in duration is actually considered chronic. It's not very common. It mostly occurs in older adults who have lax soft tissues or patients with alcohol use disorders, epilepsy, repetitive trauma. They're also associated with other injuries, such as bank art lesions, hill sacks lesions, and other fractures. So you do want to pay attention and look for those. Unfortunately, though, the disuse of this chronic dislocation will lead to atrophy of the rotator muscles quite quickly. And so that is definitely a sequelae and complication, again, to look out for. Now, when we do see one of these in the ED, these dislocations are not amenable to close reduction because of the fibrous capsular contracture. The management, though, is not very well defined, even in orthopedics literature. And so sometimes these patients will need open reduction and surgery, addressing, of course, any associated fractures and may actually also need a total joint replacement, especially if you're dealing with the dominant arm. On our end, I think the key thing we can do for these patients is to help them establish that orthopedic follow-up and emphasize the importance of a return for evaluation if there's any neurovascular compromise, which is rare, but certainly can be devastating. Wow, quite eye-opening about something we don't see often, thankfully. Now, keeping up with that ortho theme that we started, our second lesson of this issue is casing the joint, septic arthritis and gout. Thank you to Drs. Nathaniel Mann and Joan Pat for writing this article. Dr. Mann, thank you so much, not only for co-writing this article, but welcome to the podcast and thank you for joining us and telling us about, one, this article, and two, all about yourself. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so I'm Nat. That's what everybody calls me. I work out of Greenville, South Carolina. I work for the University of South Carolina Medical School and for Prisma Health Upstate. I'm an attending ER physician down here. Did four years of training at Cincinnati and then two years of fellowship at MGH in Boston in wilderness medicine. And now I'm in South Carolina. Very cool. Awesome. So then why did you write about this particular topic, the swollen painful joint? Yeah, well, certainly this is something we see a lot in the emergency room. We have a lot of patients that come in for joint-related issues, and there can be a lot of different causes that cause a joint to become red and swollen and painful. And among all those causes that are out there, there are certainly some that are more serious. And we think about septic joint as being perhaps the top of that list. If you miss it, you can end up with serious problems down the road. People can have joint destruction and long-term loss of function in their joint, and even sometimes systemic infection and death. So it is a little bit of an interest of mine personally that we don't miss these joints. All right. So first things first, what historical elements are important when we're talking about that swollen, painful joint? Well, of course, you want to get a really thorough history on these patients. You want to focus on anything that might be related to symptom onset, whether or not they've had a fever. You want to ask about previous joint infections or previous joint diseases, particularly if they've had any surgeries, not only on that joint, but surgeries anywhere on their body that might predispose them to a source for an infection. You might want to ask about systemic illnesses or what medications they're on and anything else that may have been a recent infection. And don't forget sexually transmitted diseases, which is often forgotten by a lot of folks. A lot of times we'll see folks that come into the emergency room for or an injured or swollen joint. And so we need to get that important history of recent trauma or some sort of injury. And then we also want to ask about, is this something that's happened to you before? Have you had a history of single joints being affected in the past? Or have you had a history of multiple joints being affected in the past? That makes sense. And what about physical exam findings? Any particular features to look out for? 
Yeah, the most important thing to do and make sure you document it is the ability to move that joint through its range of motion. Probably the most sensitive finding on your physical exam for an infected joint. Any pain that's severe enough to impede an attempt at movement is a really critical exam finding. And that really should make you more suspicious for septic arthritis. After that, you should really examine the joint bursa and the overlying skin and look for other signs of infection. If it's something that's localized just to the bursa, then it's probably going to be a bursitis. If it's something that's more generalized, you might want to start thinking about just arthritis. Got it. So let's go back to septic arthritis. Are there any particular groups of patients where we should be more concerned about septic arthritis in? Sure, there are. Of course, it could happen to anybody. So you don't want to rule out anybody just based on their age and who they are. But there's really a bimodal pattern of disease. So we see older folks, usually 55 years old or older, being infected. And then also sort of the younger population, kids, teenagers, up to about 15 years old or so. And those who have had previous joint conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or previous joint surgery, they're also more likely. And that can also make the diagnosis a little bit more challenging just because they've had previous injury in the past and might be a little bit more prone to some swelling there. But remember, the highest rates of death related to septic arthritis are going to be among the older patients. Don't forget about immunocompromised patients, people who have HIV or have diabetes, and those who use IV drugs as well. Those patients are a little bit more at risk for disseminated disease as well, which is a higher risk factor for illness. And some patients, like I said before, don't have any risk factors at all. So up to about 20% of patients have no predisposing factors at all for septic joints. Wow, that's pretty scary. What clinical features would particularly raise your suspicion? Yeah, any single acutely warm, painful, swollen joint that has restricted movement should raise your suspicion for septic arthritis. Really, fewer than 60% of patients with septic arthritis will present with an elevated temperature. But if somebody does have a temperature that's, that's elevated, if they have a fever, your suspicion for septic arthritis should go up. You might find from time to time an extra articular side of infection as well, or they might come in looking like they're a bit toxic. Got it. So what are common sites where we see septic arthritis? Well, anybody who's practiced in the emergency room knows that the knee is probably the most common site. It's about half of all patients who have septic arthritis, but there are other joints that can be affected as well. So the hip is about 15% of all joints. And then after that, it's kind of a potpourri of the other smaller joints, the ankle, the elbow, the shoulder, and the wrist. All of those are less than 10% um, incidence. About 10 to maybe even 20% of patients who have septic arthritis can have polyarticular disease. So that's important to think about that as well. Just because it's not a single joint doesn't mean it's not septic arthritis, especially in those who use intravenous drugs. Maybe we can talk a little bit about why these septic joints happen in the first place. Most of them arise as a result of an occult bacteremia. They can be seeded from a site remote to the joint itself, and it can even happen from things like pneumonia or pyelonephritis, and as we mentioned before, sexually transmitted diseases. So it's important to get that history on these patients to be able to elucidate if they could potentially have a septic arthritis. Of course, it can come from direct inoculation as well. So somebody who's been inoculated through trauma or an injection. And as we mentioned again, IV drug use is a relatively common source for septic arthritis. Every once in a rare while, we will see patients that have septic joints as a result of iatrogenic injury, something like an arthroscopy or a joint injection. Got it. So what are common organisms that cause septic arthritis? The most common organisms we'll find will be staph and strep, like a lot of other diseases, especially staph aureus and MRSA. Those who do end up having MRSA in their joints are more likely to have a severe infection, or they might even have a subperiosteal abscess that requires drainage. Another important organism to consider is Neisseria gonorrhea. That can be monoarticular or polyarticular. There are other organisms that can cause septic arthritis as well, and some unusual ones like Salmonella and Actinidobacillus and Listeria. Don't forget about occupational exposure to different animals, which might increase the risk of things like brucella. And for those who may be at risk for it, consider TB as well. That makes sense. Are there any lab tests that can help us differentiate infection from inflammation? You bet. The best way to differentiate inflammation from infection is to get a synovial fluid and cell counts. What you're looking for there is the cell count, the stain of the synovial fluid, a culture, and presence of any crystals within the joint. Remember, though, a gram stain can be negative in up to 40% of patients with a synovial count. The presence of crystals in the fluid can help you diagnose gout or pseudogout, but doesn't necessarily rule out septic arthritis either. Collected fluid has a better bacterial yield when inoculated into a blood culture bottle as well, so keep that in mind. Great, Pearl. So what are the magic numbers that we look for when we're interpreting the synovial fluid white blood cell count? 
Well, one of the magic numbers that we think about is 50,000 cells per microliter. And above that threshold, we tend to think of it as being infectious. An inflammatory joint tends to be less than 50,000 cells, and a non-inflammatory joint will be less than 2,000 cells. But none of those are necessarily 100% reliable. And people will have case reports of having seen infections below even 30,000 cells or 20,000 cells. So you still have to keep a really high clinical suspicion if you really think that you have a septic joint on your hands. I see. What about actual blood serum tests? Well, a lot of the typical stuff that we would order for other infectious conditions holds true in septic arthritis. So you're looking at a white blood cell count. You're probably getting an ESR and a CRP. Those can be helpful to rule in the diagnosis or sometimes even rule it out in connection with the synovial tests and the overall clinical picture. But you really probably shouldn't use those only in isolation to rule in or rule out a septic joint. Got it. So let's say we already made the diagnosis, although now I'm super scared about all those that we're missing with the lower white blood cell count in the synovial fluid. However, we made the diagnosis, we figured it out. What treatment do we need to start in the ED? Well, you're probably going to want to start some antibiotics. So something like vancomycin is probably going to have pretty good coverage for most infectious joints. You might consider ceftriaxone in the right patients who are not at risk for MRSA. In a patient who you think might have gram-negative organisms in there, something like Pseudomonas, you're thinking about adding things for that coverage, including cefepime or, or hypersilentazobactam. We used to think that prompt treatment is really very essential, but there is some evidence that delaying antibiotics until after cultures are obtained is a reasonable step. And they may actually have a better outcome because it improves the yield of testing and the eventual course of the patient. Of course, if your patient is septic or if they have severe infection or systemic symptoms, then you're probably going to want to give them antibiotics even before you get a culture. In fact, actually, if there are patients that are going to be going directly to the OR for a washout after your diagnosis, some orthopedists will request that you actually not start antibiotics until they can get in and collect a clear sample straight from the joint itself in the OR. But you always want to get an ortho consult if you think that might be the case. Uh, a lot of patients are going to need some sort of washout or arthroscopy to be able to clear up this infection. What if your patient already has an existing prosthetic joint and that's the joint you're worried about? Those can be very complicated cases. Those patients sometimes require prolonged courses of antibiotics, things like rifampin to help get into the biofilms. And you definitely want to get your orthopedist on the line for this one because sometimes these patients go on to require hardware removal. All right. So I think that was such a great summary of septic arthritis and how to address that. How about other diagnoses that we need to consider in the emergency department with that painful swollen joint? Well, I think we need to think about gout, especially if you're seeing it in the first MCP of the big toe. Sometimes you'll hear that called podagra. Usually that's going to be men, usually in their 40s or later. And it's usually going to be accompanied by the deposition of monosodium urate crystals, which is that classic negative birefringent crystal that you'll see on the board exam. If those crystals collect in the soft tissue, though, you might actually see something called TOFI. And that is oftentimes pathognomonic for the presence of gout. Patients can also have deposition of those crystals in the kidneys, and that can cause kidney stones and urate neuropathy. Acute gout attacks are typically preceded by periods of asymptomatic hyperuricemia, but you may not have an elevated serum uric acid on those patients, and not having an elevated uric acid does not necessarily mean that they don't have gout. So remember that any patient with a history of gout can still present with septic arthritis and may actually be at higher risk for septic arthritis. So a history of gout alone is not enough for the diagnosis unless septic arthritis can be excluded. Think about combination joints and gout as well. Sometimes these patients will have affected joints that include joints that are adjacent to each other, like the knee and the ankle or the toe and the ankle or the shoulder and the wrist. This oftentimes happens with patients who have that subcutaneous toe five I mentioned earlier. I see. Now, if your lab is not able to actually test for the crystals in real time, how can we make this diagnosis? Well, luckily, our friends over at the American College of Rheumatology have given us a little bit of help on that one. So they have a recommendation of what we can use to make a diagnosis of gout if we can't get a crystal out of the joint. They say that at least six of the following lists need to be present to make that diagnosis of gout. So that would be asymmetric swelling within a joint on the x-ray, the first metatarsophalangeal joint that's tender or swollen, that podagra we mentioned earlier. If a patient has hyperuricemia, that rules in for one of those six conditions. Maximal inflammation developed within one day if it's a monoarthritis attack. More than one acute arthritis attack in the past. Any redness observed over the joint, subcortical cysts without erosions on an x-ray. If you suspect that they have TOFI, if they have a synovial fluid culture that's negative for organisms during the acute attack, 
if they have a unilateral first metatarsal phalangeal joint or a unilateral tarsal joint attack. So any six of those would rule in the presence of gout. Got it. Definitely great to know this when we don't have the ability to actually look at crystals or if we can't actually get that fluid, which I'm not sure about you, but toes can be really rough. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say we made that diagnosis. How are we supposed to treat gout? Well, it's different from septic arthritis. You're looking at anti-inflammatories instead. So we're probably treating those patients with NSAIDs or corticosteroids if they don't have contraindications to them. Those are usually the first line therapies for acute gout. Colchicine is an effective second line therapy, but it can have some adverse effects like nausea and vomiting and some abdominal discomfort. And it really should be reserved for patients without renal impairment. Those medications, of course, can be supplemented with opioids if needed for severe pain. Things like oxycodone and hydrocodone are oftentimes used. This was such a great review of such important conditions that we see in the ED. Any final pearls for our listeners? Yeah, I think just remember to keep septic arthritis on your differential. Don't forget that if you have a joint that's red and swollen and hot, you have to think about septic arthritis before moving on to other conditions. And the best way to do that is with an arthrocentesis of that joint. Great pearl. Thank you, Nat, so much again for writing this article and for coming on this podcast and sharing your wisdom with us. Hopefully, we'll have you back soon with another article. <laughs> sure. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Our drug box this month is on tenecteplase for acute stroke, which I suspect we're all hearing more and more because I'm hearing that a lot of centers across at least the United States are switching over to tenecteplase as an option for treatment in acute ischemic stroke. So we usually talk about alteplase because it is currently the only FDA-approved thrombolytic for acute ischemic stroke, but we've gotten more and more data that have shown that tenecteplase has a similar efficacy and safety compared to alteplase, though up until this point, the optimal dose has been unclear. The NORTEST-2 study, which is the Norwegian tenecteplase stroke trial 2, compared tenecteplase 0.4 mg per kilogram with alteplase 0.9 mg per kilogram, the standard dosing. And they found that tenecteplase was associated with more symptomatic ICH and overall ICH, as well as mortality. So I think we all agree that this particular dosing, as it was studied in this study, 0.4 mg per kilogram should not be used for acute ischemic stroke. There has been other studies that have looked at a lower dose of tenecteplase, 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, and that seems to be a growing consensus across institution as the dose to be adopted if you are switching over and uh, providing tenecteplase as a treatment alternative for acute ischemic stroke. Great review. Last but not least, our tox box for this month is sodium fluoroacetate poisoning which is a white powder originally used as rodenticide and now is only used in livestock collars to ward off predators. It is extremely hazardous and all ingestions should be considered serious because if it's something that's made to ward off the wildlife predators, you probably should not ingest it as a human being, but that's just me. Now its oral absorption is rapid and it can also be inhaled or absorbed through non-intact skin. So if there are skin breaks or cuts or anything like that. It works by halting the TCA cycle, and I will not share the details. You are welcome. The patients present with vomiting, confusion, seizures, hypotension, prolonged QT, respiratory depression, and acidosis. Treatment is supportive with fluids, pressors, benzos, propofol, or phenobar for the seizures. And if they end up with hypocalcemia, then give them IV calcium as well. In theory, Lipid emulsion and methylene blue can be helpful, but that's just a theory. So call your poison control. Now, if your patient ingested it and four hours later they remain asymptomatic, they can go bye-bye. They can go home. Yes, yes, home. So thank you, Wendy, for taking the time to go through this issue with me. I learned a lot. Our dear listeners, we hope that you've enjoyed listening to us as much as we've enjoyed recording this. And we hope that you find the Critical Decisions publication as well as our podcast always informative, often enlightening, and never boring. Reach out to us on our Twitter handles. Mine is at Dania Koja. Mine is at EM underscore NCC. And until next month, bye-bye.